right, all right. So good to see you all this morning. You can have a seat. Well, you guys really love each other. Pastor Jason Fisher said you do, but you know, you don't really believe him until you come and see it. Like sinful people loving each other. That's what just happened right now. Uh, that's amazing. Give yourself a hand clap for that. Way to love each other. Hey, I'm so glad to be here. My name is Tim. I am the lead pastor of Phoenix Bible Church in the heart of Phoenix. Uh, we started uh, Phoenix Bible Church almost 10 years ago, uh, coming this October. And if you're new to Heritage, uh, they started about 11 years ago. And so we've always just kind of been drafting behind you guys. And so, so thankful for you and your presence in the city, uh, your friendship and partnership in the gospel. Uh, Jason said I could make fun fun of him today. Um, and I have done that. And I, I will do that. I'm glad to do that after the service with you. Uh, just come talk to me. Come find me. But, um, but I, I would say, man, Jason is one of my closest friends. And uh, I consider him, as a pastor, I consider him my pastor, uh, mostly because he's so much older than I am. Uh, but, you know, but, but also he has some wisdom and loves Jesus, too. <laughs> but, uh, no, really, I, I've been around some pastors, like at conferences. I've worked for a pastor who's kind of like big time in the Christian world. And so I've kind of seen it all, and uh, you have the real deal, uh, Pastor Jason Fisher. Yeah, you can clap. He's probably going to watch this later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's going to watch for who's not clapping, for sure. Gold stars for who clapped, and yeah. Uh, no, but he really loves Jesus. He loves you. Like, he legitimately loves you, and he's the kind of guy you want to journey with for the next 50 years on mission with Jesus in the earth. And so if you're new here, we're so glad that you are here. And uh, something cool about Phoenix Bible Church that I just have to share is uh, we just did kind of a u unique church merger uh, a little year and a half ago. And uh, Bethany Bible Church in Central Phoenix like became Phoenix Bible Church. And they're like 70-year-old church merged with this like almost 10-year-old church. And so it's kind of crazy, unprecedented thing. But Bethany Bible Church planted a church called Scottsdale Bible Church. It's this little church down the street. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And uh, uh, at one point in time, Bethany Bible Church planted Scottsdale Bible Church. And if you're new, again, Scottsdale Bible Church planted Heritage Church. So I think we're cousins or some kind of extended family. And so it's just kind of this beautiful picture of the Big C Church in Phoenix and the, the kingdom impact that is happening across the valley. And so excited to be a part of it with you. Uh, so pumped to get into this series, The Whole Story. If this is your very first Sunday, you guys are going through the whole Bible in a year. There's a reading plan. I heard there's a bookmark if you want to find out where everybody is in the reading plan. And if you are new, man, just jump in. Uh, we're going to talk about Ecclesiastes Today, it's 12 chapters long, so we're going to do all 12 chapters. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to do like just a little dive into the first chapter and kind of fly over of the book. Uh, but man, read this on your own. I love that you guys are going through this. Take this home with you and dive deeper into Ecclesiastes. But let's pray uh, as we do that together. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I thank you for this morning. I, I do thank you for Heritage Church and their gospel influence in North Phoenix and across the valley. Uh, God, I thank you for Phoenix Bible Church, who right now is doing the same thing that we are doing in this room, just across our city, in the heart of our city, and God, I pray that we would both uh, make much of not one church name, not one brand, not one person, uh, but the name above every name that is Jesus Christ, and we, we've done that in worship through song. God, I pray that we would do that now through worship in your word. And that right now, God, you would do what I cannot do. You would give us hearts that are softened to your word. You would give us eyes that are illuminated to your word. And you would give us minds that are sharpened to receive and understand your word. And most of all, God, you would give us hands to do what you call us to do in your word. Even in a, a bit of a difficult text to find that in Ecclesiastes. Uh, illuminate your truth to us by your spirit, through your word, for the name and fame of Jesus Christ. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said Amen. Well, hey, I have my wife with me uh, today, and we've been married almost 18 years. We have three kids, and I, I remember when we weren't married and we were just dating. And I remember as a single person, I had a lot of insecurities in life, a lot of anxiety in life. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. And, and as I looked ahead to marriage, I thought, that's going to fix it. 
<laughs> Some of you have been married for a long time. You know that's, that you laughed because that's not true, right? But I, I thought like Jerry Maguire, like she's going to complete me, right? And like all my insecurities, anxieties, they're going to go away and I'm going to all of a sudden be this beacon of confidence, right? Because I'm married. And then I remember we, we got married. And, and in fact, not only did it not do all that, I, it exposed my insecurities, Right? Many people will say marriage is not for your happiness, it's for your holiness. And that, that happened. It's like a mirror. And it started to expose all the sin in my life that I didn't even know was there. And I thought, well, that's, that's not quite what I was after in, in marriage. And then I remember when I got in, involved in ministry, I just thought, man, if, if I could be a lead pastor... Man, I just, I looked up to all these lead pastors, and they were world changers, and they had these sweet little families, and every just, everything seemed so perfect, and they were writing books and speaking at conferences, and I thought, man, I want to do that, and if I could just be a lead pastor, then I will have arrived, and then I will be making a, an eternal impact, and it's going to be amazing, and then I remember when I came to Phoenix and started Phoenix Bible Church and became a lead pastor, it was kind of messy, I'll tell you the story later. We, we had a messy start as a church and being a lead pastor. Like, I don't know if you know this. Like, when I meet with people, they're not always coming to tell me, like, how much they love Jesus, the church, and me. <laughs> they usually want to meet with me because they, they don't like one of those. And sometimes it's actually me, right? And that's, like, like that's the job description of being a lead pastor. And I, I just thought, hey, this wasn't what I thought it was going to, to be. And then I remember as a, a lead pastor early on, like our first few years, we met in buildings and set up and tore down and rented space. And I just thought, hey, one day we're going to get a permanent building. And that will be the Mecca. And then we'll have arrived. And then like Phoenix Bible Church will be a success. And, and once we get a permanent building, and then a year and a half ago, we got a permanent building. We got 10 acres. We got seven buildings debt-free in the heart of Phoenix. And it was just like, man, this, okay, this is amazing. Now it's going to be smooth sailing from here on. And then I realized, like, we got a lot of old buildings that have a lot of deferred maintenance. And just a couple weeks ago, we had a, a, a massive breaker go out in our chapel that affected, like, three buildings. And it was 19, come on, somebody, $19,000 to replace a breaker. And I thought, oh, this, was not, this was not what I was thinking it would be, and I don't know if this is true for you, but for me, every stage of my life, I always thought the next stage of life would bring the kind of purpose, fulfillment, and joy that I was after. And yet when I arrived at that new stage of life, it was, it was empty. It was futile. It was fleeting. It was just kind of like chasing the wind. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 1, it says chasing the wind or striving after the wind. In other places, it says that. It's this word picture of, like, everything in life that's under the sun, apart from God, is, like, going after and grabbing something. And you actually, you, you grab it. Like, you grab that job or you grab that spouse or you grab that money. You grab that pleasure. You grab it. And then you open your hand and there's, there's nothing there. And it's not what you thought it would be. And as we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, you need to know this is a different kind of book. Right? You have literature and genres of literature and scripture. So you got the prophetic books, the historic books. you got narrative. you got the epistles and kind of a lot of propositional truth and like how to, like Christian handbooks, like Romans. And Ecclesiastes is like none of those. Ecclesiastes is in the poetical genre of scripture in the Bible, the wisdom genre of scripture in, the, in your Bible. And so it's, it's very different. It's written by King Solomon. He was the third king in Israel, son of King David. But, but most scholars believe he writes this book later in life. When he's much older, he calls himself the preacher, the Koheleth in Hebrew. It's, it's the one who would sit everybody down like, like we're doing here and he would just share life lessons. That's the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's poetical. It's philosophical. Some of you, if you're students, like, you should get class credit for this. You're, you're not, but you could, right? Because it's this 
like Solomon's philosophizing about life, and it's 12 chapters of that, like kind of over and over and over. And if some of you, and you should, go and read Ecclesiastes, all 12 chapters, and I would recommend that you do that. Some of you, you're going to hate it because you love positive, encouraging (laughs) K-love. And you're just like, man, I don't, where is the positive, encouraging stuff? Like, I don't... I don't see that in here, and, and, and you're going to think, well, like, Solomon's going to be like, nothing matters, vanity of vanities, like, everything's meaningless, and you're going to be like, Solomon, like, John 10.10, 10. like, it says that Jesus came and made life matter, and we can have life that, that does matter, and life to the full, like, Solomon, like, you, you should go on and read that, and Solomon would tell you that that's a different sermon for a different day, that what I'm trying to do in Ecclesiastes is I'm trying to show you life apart from God and the meaninglessness that it has in it. And I, I think you'll see why. It's not just to make us all emo, okay? Like, it's not just some of you are like, you're going to love. You're on the other side of the spectrum. You're going to love Ecclesiastes. You're like, I've been telling everybody. <laughs> like, every Sunday I'm like, life is meaningless. This is all dumb. It's just stupid. And you're like, that's not the point of it either, right? So, so we're going to see what, what is the point. I'm gonna, if you'd like to know where we're going ahead of time, I'm going to give you two points. And at the end, I'm going to give you two points of application. Uh, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you haven't already, grab a Bible. Uh, grab a Bible, get this in front of you. Just open up to the middle of your Bible. If you're new to your Bible, you'll see Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. We're going to read a section, and I'll give you my, my first point off the top. It is this, is that life is beyond our control. Life is beyond our control. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 1, it says this, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and round goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea and yet the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow there again. And all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new, it has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So as we look at that portion of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I mean, just notice how Solomon starts this whole book out. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I love that Solomon kind of eases into it, don't you? I mean, I don't know if you've read other books of the Bible, but there's typically an introduction, right? There's typically like greetings, grace and peace to you. No, Solomon says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, right off the bat. And that word vanity, it's this really interesting word in the original language, it's this word havel. And it's used like 30 plus times throughout the book. It, it really bookends the book. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, it says vanity of vanities. At the end in chapter 12, it says vanity of vanities once again. And you see it woven throughout the whole book. It's this idea of meaninglessness or, 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 or futility or fragility or a fleeting nature of life. But it's this really interesting word where it's hard to translate. And so even some of your translations may say life is absurd or or something like that instead of vanity. Uh, One English word doesn't quite capture the full meaning of this. But but literally, in the original language, this word havel, it it means like a vapor or a mist. And so it's something something like this. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That Solomon says, hey, this is life. It's just a vapor. It's just a a mist. And you got to understand who Solomon is. For him to say that, it is significant. Like Solomon was like Jeff Bezos, Hugh Hefner, Albert Einstein, all wrapped into one, okay? Like he had 
all the, the wealth in the world, like scholars at this time, uh, or at this time scholars would tell us that he, he, if he was in our day, he'd be worth like a trillion dollars. That if you go and read 1 Kings, you'll see uh, accounts of all the gold that he had. His throne was made of gold. The steps were made of gold. Statues made of gold. Furniture made of gold. Utensils made of gold. He had all the wealth you could ever imagine. A trillionaire. And yet he was also the wisest person in the world. Many of you know that story in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 and 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon has this kind of Aladdin genie moment, right? Like you Solomon, you can have whatever you want. Whatever you ask for, I will give it to you. And what does he ask for? Wisdom. The wealthiest man that ever lived. The wisest man that ever lived. The most powerful man in his day. The most pleasurable man in his day. Most accounts will tell us he had 300 concubines and 700 wives. I don't even know how, how someone does that, right? But, but that's, that's what he had. He had everything you could ever ask for and wish for. And yet he says, it's all, you know what it is? It's all this. It doesn't amount to anything. It's a vapor. It's fleeting. It's futile. Why would someone say that? Well, if you look closely, Solomon is talking about life. Look at verse 3. Life under the sun. Another phrase. If you read Ecclesiastes, you're going to see over and over 20 time, 29 times in the book. Life under the sun. It's referring to life in a fallen world. That since Genesis 3, sin has infected and affected everything. And so Solomon is looking upon life in a fallen world, life apart from God, life under the sun, not life beyond the sun. And this is where sometimes if you're a Christian in the room, you get frustrated with Ecclesiastes because you think we have the full counsel of God's word, Tim. Like we have, like we know Jesus is beyond the sun and he comes to life under the sun and he brings meaning and purpose and fulfillment of life. He redeems all of life and that one day he's going to come back and do that for good. And Solomon would say, hey, that's a sermon for another day, that what he's trying to show you is what life is like under the sun. And if you look at verse 8, he describes it. He says, there's a weariness in a world and a life under the sun, because you realize, verse 9, this is just the way it's always been, and it will always be this way. Verse 10, he says, there's really nothing new in life. And, And some of us, again, we read that, we're like, Solomon, I'm not so sure. Like, do you know about Elon Musk? I, I think he just launched another rocket into space, right? Like, do, do you know about, like, Tesla? And, and all, like, there are things that are new in life. And what I would say to you, what he's referring to is more function than form. That, that yes, there's new ways to travel, but at some level, we're still just traveling. Some of you say, Tim, there's there's new things like Amazon Prime. Like, it's amazing. I can get something delivered to my house tonight. Used to, like, we'd have to go to Walmart. Like, we'd have to go to a store. And and now it's like, it's so, it's new, Tim. And I would say, ah, you're still shopping. You're still spending money to get a product. Like, people have always done that. There's really nothing new in life under the sun. And, And Solomon's trying to to show us that. And even if you think about your goals and aspirations in life, you think about like your great-grandfather, like what was his or her, or your great-grandmother, what was their goals in life? Well, it's something like this. Like, I don't don't know your great-grandparents, full disclosure. But I guarantee you it's something like this. I want to get a good job so I can make some money, so I can raise a family. Well, why? why? So I, I can have kids who eventually go on to get a good job and make some money, and so they can raise a family. Well, why? So that one day they can have kids who will get a job and make some money and raise a family. And, like, that's, that's everybody's story for all of time. Like, that's our, like, nothing new under the sun. Life apart from God is elusive. It's repetitive. We find ourselves, and maybe some of you feel this this morning, in a bit of a hamster wheel. It's like rinse and repeat, like spring, summer, oh, summer in Phoenix, it's here again, it comes every time. And yet we're always surprised by it. We're like, somebody just, did you see it was 110 today? 
I'm like, yes, I saw it last summer too. <laughs> like, it's, it's always this way. That's why we have a pool. Like, what are you, there's nothing new. Like, life is elusive. It's repetitive. It's just like this vapor. It comes and, and it goes. And Solomon is showing us that, if you continue to look at it with me, that even when you die, Everything else, like you die, things stop for you, but everything else just keeps going. I, I don't know if you've been to any funerals lately, but just like, I mean, we have fast funerals in our society. I, I've officiated funerals, and usually they're like, hey, man, you got 30 minutes, and then we got, we're going to sing two songs, and then we're going to go eat potato salad. Like, we got to get out of here. And people just, they go on with their lives, and that's what Solomon points out. Verse 4, look at that verse. He says, a generation comes. And a generation goes. Verse 5 through 7, he gives us these, these word pictures, the sun, the wind, the streams. They just keep rising. The wind keeps blowing. The streams keep flowing. And it just never ends. Verse 11, and no one even remembers. That's humbling, isn't it? That's, that's humbling for me. Like, no, no one even remembers. You know, it's like that whole practice, like how many of you know like your great-grandfather's name? And there's always somebody who was on Ancestry.com like last night. I do. And like, but most people like, they, they, they would say, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I can find out, but I, I don't know. And that's, that's humbling, isn't it? That's the world, that's the life under the sun that Solomon is talking about. And I don't like to think about this. I, I, I like to think about like my great-grandkids, when they're, tucked in at bed at night and getting ready to go to sleep, that they're going to read about the adventures of Tim, right? They're going to be snuggling into their blankets, and they're going to be hearing stories of, like, your great-grandfather, Tim Birdwell. Oh, my goodness. Game changer. Like, he was a pastor. He was really resilient, like, really like a go, go-getter, overcomer, like, did great things in the city of Phoenix that, that we're still talking about to this day. You know, and like just like on a little bit, like he was low key athletic as well. And uh, you know, I mean, he could shoot. I mean, not many people know about it, like, but he could shoot a basketball. Like he could play tennis. Like he could lift some weights. You know, like and uh, and he was like also he was pretty funny. Like if you want to laugh, you go with Tim. And and I just picture like the kids are going to bed at night, great grandkids, and they're just all hearing about my adventures. And what Solomon Solomon just told me is, bro, they're not even going to remember your name. It's humbling. And you start to realize, like, life is beyond our control. And Ecclesiastes, man, it's an important book for us to go through, not only at Heritage Church, but at Phoenix Bible Church, at every church, is because in 2024, we, we all of us, if you've been around church for a long time and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you would say, yeah, life is beyond my control. Like, I surrender all. I know that Him, But functionally, we don't live that way. Well, functionally, we're, we're trying to put our kids in spots and their club sports team and, and the right school, like Scottsdale Christian Academy, like that, that, I'm going to put them in there and they're not going to be corrupted by like all the, all the stuff in our culture and all the stuff about gender and sexuality. I mean, if I just, if I put them in the right school, that'll do it, Tim. And if I, if I get the right job and if I get the right promotion and if I get the right portfolio and if we get the right presidential candidate, no, Tim, we can control this thing. And we can get back to the roots of the Bible and the foundations of a Christian nation. And like, I, I, can, I can maneuver and I can fit the puzzle pieces together to make all this thing work. And, and so that my life and my family can be the exception and we can have life under our control. You know, under God's control, yes, glory to be to Jesus Christ. But, you know, really it's like under Tim's control. And what Solomon is preaching, he's the preacher, the Koheleth, he's preaching at an old age and saying, hey, man, I, I've, I've tried all that. You know what it amounts to? It's vanity. It's hevel. It's nothing. You cannot control your life and this life under the sun. Are you encouraged? Let's keep going, shall we? Verse 12. Verse 12, he keeps going. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. 
It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, hevel, a striving after the wind. He says, what is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great, great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. That means annoying, literally. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So Solomon says life is beyond our control, but he also says life is beyond our comprehension. Again, some context. This is the same guy who is considered the wisest man to ever live. The same guy who he, he says in this text, if we read it, verse 16, he's acquired more wisdom than all before him over Jerusalem. He's saying he has more wisdom than his father, King David. King David was a giant of the faith, a, a giant king in the lineage. And he says, yeah, I, I got more wisdom than that. He even says that he's, in verse 17, look at that verse, he knows madness and folly as well. Like if you've seen the movie Batman Begins, like the reboot of Batman, in my opinion, it's the best Batman. And, and Batman Begins, like, you know, Christian Bale, he goes out and tries to understand the criminal mind. Anybody seen this? He even goes to prison just to try to understand. The, the, it, this is what Solomon's saying, hey, I've done that. I, I don't only really know wisdom, but I know madness and folly. Like, I've experienced everything there is to experience. I've taken all the master classes. I've taken every exam, and I've aced every single one of them. I've seen it all. I understand it all. It's wisdom. It's not just knowledge. He's saying, I know the application of all knowledge in every arena. And yet he says, it's vanity, it's a puff of smoke, it's meaningless, it's futile, it's fleeting. He says specifically, the world is still crooked, and it can't be made straight. Verse 18, he says, in much wisdom, like the wiser I have gotten, the more annoyed I have gotten. The more things like he understands, the more things actually don't make sense sense in life. And again, if you look at our world today in 2024, like this is true for us as well. Many of us, like we, we know, like we have more information and we have more wisdom and we have more books and we have more PhDs, letters behind our name. We have more degrees. We have more technology than anyone in history. We have Oprah. Right, she's giving away schools, and I mean, we got Matthew McConaughey writing books, trying to be governor, like, all right, all right. Like, we got, like, we got, like, lots of, like, we have Elon Musk. We have Jeff Bezos. We have Bill Gates. We have doctors and attorneys and, and, and like, researchers, and we have more access to more information. Like, even, like, for my kids. My kids are 15, 11, and 9. I mean, but just the things that they're learning and the things they have at their fingertips that, that before, like, I had to go to a public library to learn, they just ask Alexa, right? I mean, just the other day, they were asking me, I mean, smart kids, right? They were asking me, like, hey, Dad, wh why does Saturn have these rings around the planet? And I was like, um, you know, I tried to make up something to sound smart, like, because I'm their dad, and I was like, uh, I, I'm not sure. And I was like, Alexa, why does Saturn have rings around its planet? And right away, it's like, hey, there's fragments of ice and rock that because of like the 80-something moons around Saturn, they're caught in orbit and they just stay in orbit. And it was just like, hey, guys, that's why. And I was just thinking about, I mean, how many of you, when you were a kid, like to find out a fact like that, you had to go to the library and find Encyclopedia Britannica's. And searched till you found an S and found Saturn and looked it up. And a few hours later, you're like, oh, it's fragments of ice and rock. <laughs> and, you know. I mean, how many of you with, with music, like, like to learn a song, you'd have to just listen to the radio continuously till they played it. And then I don't know how you rolled, but like I would put a cassette in and like re illegally record it. You know, like get the, get the blank cassette quick, it's on. 
Like Tim McGraw should have been a cowboy, right? Well, that's just me. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's not very spiritual. Sorry. Um, but now it's like, hey, what's that song? What's that song we sang at church? Like my daughter will come home. I love it. She goes, what's that song we sang at church? I'm like, well, what are some words from it? And I'll look it up on Spotify and we'll worship right then. Just the click of a button. We have more information, technology, wisdom at our fingertips than ever, and yet there's still human trafficking. Yet there's still abuse. There's still cancer. There's still debt. There's still racism. There's still divorce. Wait, why? Why haven't we have everything we need to know? Like, it's all at our feet. Like, why? Listen, some of you, this isn't a theory. Like, you know this in life. Like, I know for me, uh, there, I remember a few years back, there was this lady, she was on CNN, and she was 104 years old. And they were saying, like, how do you do it? How are you so old and still so healthy? And she was like, you know what my secret is? Three Dr. Peppers a day. <laughs> and you just look at that, and you're like, wow, okay, all right, I'm in. <laughs> you know, like, you got me convinced? And, but the, see, 104, three Dr. Peppers a day. That was all she could come up with. And then, and then yet I look at, like, right now, my, my dad, he's 74 years old, about to be 75. He has cancer. And he keeps, like, like cleared it, but now he's had some setbacks. And my dad's always been pretty healthy. He eats healthy. He goes for walks. He tells me how many miles and steps he's clocking with his walks. He's generally a positive human being. He's a believer in Jesus Christ. He used to be a deacon at our church. I, I don't think he drinks Dr. Pepper at all. Right? And he's like, he's, he's optimistic. He prays every day. Every Sunday for the last 10 years, he's a great dad. He has prayed for me and sent me a text praying for you as you preach at Phoenix Bible Church. He sent that this morning. Every Sunday. And I don't know, some of you, you've met some older, seasoned veterans of life who are not like that, who are kind of grumpy. Who will just, life is meaningless, you're meaningless, I hate this, I hate that. My dad's not like that. He's optimistic. Well, why does he have cancer? And why does this lady live to 104 drinking three Dr. Peppers a day? And why does this guy, who's just a jerk, live that way and even get promoted in life and, people, and get richer in life? Why does that happen? And, and Solomon would say, verse 18, well, it's a vexation. It's annoying. It doesn't, I'm perplexed. It doesn't make sense. And many of you, you can look at your life and say, yeah, there's a few things like that. There's a guy at work who's just shady, but yet he gets promoted. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, my, my kid is actually struggling with their health. And we keep, we keep giving all of our money away to PCH, and they can't fix it. And yet, a family that I know, I mean, their kids, like, they're completely fine, just playing sports, school, everything's great, and they don't even follow Jesus, and they don't tithe, and they don't care, and they're not reading the whole Bible in a year, and like, I don't, Tim, there's some things that don't make sense in life, and Solomon is trying to say, hey, I get that, and not just Solomon, God is trying to say, hey, I get that. You ever think about why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible? Why books like Job are in the Bible? And if I'm writing a story to make God look awesome and to make everybody want to follow him, and I leave those out. Like Job, a guy who just does, like he's a blameless, righteous man, and yet he suffers, get everything taken away from him. Why do why you put that in the Bible? Ecclesiastes, Solomon, this, this, this king, this wise, he's the wisest man. And he, the wisest man is telling you, if you just keep getting wiser, you'll just keep getting more annoyed. I, I think it's because God is transparent. God is not trying to hide from the sufferings in life. Aren't you, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God's not just trying to paint a rosy picture and say, yeah, positive, encouraging, Caleb, like that's all it is all the time? And then you're like, well, Tim, that doesn't match with my life and my sickness and my sin that I keep struggling with and just the daily repetitive grind of the mundane. And like, 
Aren't you glad that God relates to you in this moment through Solomon? And so what do we do with this? Uh, Two things as we close. The first thing is don't give up. Surrender control. Don't give up, but surrender control. I think you can read a book like uh, Ecclesiastes and you can be kind of like, Yes, life is meaningless. Let's all just go drink, eat, and be merry. In fact, Solomon says that in chapter 8. Let's just like phone this thing in and give up and sit on the lazy boy recliner. Like he just said it, life is meaningless. It's the vanity of vanities, like the holy of holies. This is the most meaningless place. So I'm just going to phone this thing in. And let me tell you, I've had those tendencies like, as a dad of three kids running around being their Uber driver, man, sometimes it's exhausting. Amen, parents? It's okay. It's a safe place, okay? We can say that in church today. I remember one time specifically, like, we, we just had a really busy week, and we were doing some things at a family. As a family, we were at this event that I didn't want to be at. And I, I remember they had Little Miss Barbecue for lunch. How many of you have had Little Miss Barbecue? You've had a taste of heaven, right? That is life beyond the sun, okay? It's amazing. Brisket, oh, it's so good. I'm um, getting hungry just thinking about it. But I remember, like, I was exhausted. I was at this event I didn't want to be at. My kids were whining. And I, mean, I had this little, like, like, brisket plate in front of me. And I remember, like, I went over in the shade, like, where it wasn't, like, the sun wasn't shining. It was in July. And I found a cool spot in the shade. And I was eating this brisket. And I had my ear pods in. And I was listening to music. And my kids weren't anywhere to be found. <laughs> And I just, can I be honest in church today? I just remember thinking, like, I could do this for the rest of my life. (laughs) Like, I just, I could check out. Is that what Solomon is saying? Is that what God is saying? I'm sorry, but no. He's not saying give up on life. He's saying surrender control of your life. Stop looking at your 401K like it's going to bring security for you. Have one. Be wise, but don't think it's your stability. See Jesus Christ as that, who has eternal treasure for you that's undefiled, preserved for you in heaven, that will not mold or rust, can't be stolen. Make sure you don't put your hope in the stock market and the ups and downs. You put your hope in Jesus Christ and your eternal treasure. Surrender control. Make sure with your kids, make sure you don't think, well, I'm going to put them in this school. I'm going to, like, they're going to go in these club sports. And they're going to, like, we're going to do these habits at home. And then everything's going to work out. And that's where I'm putting my trust. Surrender control of your kids to God. Trust that God loves your kids more than you do. And pray for them. And point them to Jesus. And point them to their perfect heavenly father, not to you, ultimately. As you think about, I don't know if you know, we're in an election year. And the chaos is just about to ensue. And it's not just out there, but it's in here. And it's in our churches. And people get so riled up because they think the world hinges on whether this old man or this old man gets elected. I may not get invited back. Sorry, Jason. (laughs) Um, man, g- listen, get out there and vote. It's an incredible freedom that you have. Have convictions. Lobby, rally, I don't care. Do what you want to do. But just make sure that's not where your hope lies. Just make sure like after November, that date, when everything goes down, you, the next day, you don't, you're not out there like triumphantly celebrating on top of the mountain like, we did it, we won. Or like cowering in the background like, getting more guns, like, we didn't do it, we lost. Just make sure that's not you. Just make sure you're like, man, whoever wins these next four years, we have a Jesus who is Alpha and Omega, the never-ending king of all the universe. I think he has America, right? So don't give up on life, but just surrender control to every area of your life. Physically, sexually, relationally, politically, emotionally, 
Surrender all those areas to God. What would it look like today if you read this and just thought, okay, this is what I'm faced with. Jesus, you, you take it all. You, you can have it all. I don't have control and I don't have comprehension, but you do and I'm gonna cling to you. What if you did that? The last thing, empathize with the hopelessness in this world while elevating hope in God. Empathize with life under the sun, but elevate to life beyond the sun. This is where we can. We have the full counsel of God, God's word. We have 66 books, 40 plus authors written over 1,500 years. We have the fulfillment of everything in Jesus Christ. So after you read the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, you should flip over to the New Testament. And you should see that a God who is beyond the sun didn't stay beyond the sun, who's perfect in every way, holy in every way, glorious in every way, in his own intrinsic worth and nature. He stepped down to life beneath the sun, under the sun, into the brokenness. And he lived the perfect life that you cannot. And he died a death for all of the brokenness and all the sin and all the things that don't make sense. And he died a death once for all. And he rose again and he conquered it victoriously and gloriously. Amen? And he redeemed it all. And he will redeem it all one day. And that you you empathize with people who don't feel that right now but you elevate them to the hope we have in Jesus Christ beyond the sun. So when you're at a funeral, maybe like the first thing you say isn't like, hey, all things work together for good. I've been to some of those funerals, and I see a family member coming up, but somebody lost their son. Like, it's not supposed to happen. It doesn't make sense. It's it's vexing. Like, you're supposed to die before they die, but it didn't happen that way. And somebody comes and says like, hey, but all things work together No, like part of reading Ecclesiastes is we empathize with people. Say, I know that's hard. I know it doesn't make sense. And we empathize. But then in due time, we do elevate them. We empathize under the sun. We elevate beyond the sun to Jesus Christ. And we do both. And we hold both of those in tension as believers in Jesus who live life under the sun where it doesn't make sense, but who know Jesus Christ redeems it all. And we elevate people's eyes to him. Amen? Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. I thank you for Ecclesiastes. God, I do pray that we would study this book, dive into this book, embrace the words of this book and the the wisdom of this book. From Solomon, God, that we would, he's the preacher, we're sitting at his feet and we would learn today. We wouldn't harden our hearts and think, well, he doesn't know and I think this and that we would receive this word by the power of your spirit and we would apply this word to our lives. God, that we would surrender everything we have in our lives, everything we have in our churches, in our nation, unto you. Because as hard as we try, we we can't control it. And we would surrender it and we would trust you. God, I just know in this room, there's some men and women who and there's some difficult situations in their life right now, and they need to do that. And it's hard. But I pray Solomon and this, this word today would stir us to do that, even when it's hard. God, I pray for all of us that we would, we would fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. The same God who was working through Solomon is the same God who's working today. Is the same God that's going to come back one day and restore all.